Hey everybody, welcome back to Windy City Astrophotography. My name is Nick, and in this video I'm hopefully going to be completing an image that was on the verge of failure. So hopefully tonight, if all goes well, that's going to be completed. But first, where am I? Well, I'm excited to be in a dark sky site. I got in my van, packed up all my telescope stuff, and uh, brought myself down here about two hours south of Chicago to this international dark sky site. I'm at the Middle Fork River Forest Preserve. The Middle Fork River Forest Preserve is the first international dark sky park in the state of Illinois. This place is great, I will say. It's got shielded lights all over the place, so uh, nice and dark. I've set myself up in a slightly more remote section with my uh, a little bit of lights here for the video and hopefully not disturbing too many people. And I've been down here a few times doing some dark sky shooting. Usually I'm in Chicago shooting narrowband images, but uh, here I get a chance to uh, let the Rasa off the leash a bit and let it go nuts with some broadband imaging. Now, how dark is dark? Well, I will say this is a Bortle 4 location. On the Bortle scale, which goes from Bortle 1, the best, up to Bortle 9, which is very light polluted, that would be uh, like the city of Chicago, this is Bortle 4, which is certainly not the darkest sky. And uh, a lot of people I know in the comments have told me they've got uh, a Bortle 4 at the end of their driveway, which is fantastic. Uh, for me, this is a treat. So for tonight, I've got my usual setup for the scope. I've got the Celestron Rasa 8 telescope. I've also got the ASI 1600mm Pro, my monochrome imaging camera that I'll be using uh, tonight only to shoot a green filter. I'm using the 2-inch Botter RGB filters, uh, but I'm only going to be shooting the green tonight, which I'll get to in a little bit. I've also got my old workhorse of a mount, the Ioptron SEM40, that's doing the guiding for me tonight. So I came here tonight specifically to shoot a dark nebula. This is the Seahorse Nebula, which is number 150 on Barnard's list of dark nebulae. It's in the constellation of Cepheus the King, uh, basically a circumpolar part of the sky here in the mid-northern latitudes. And it's quite near, actually, a pretty well-known astrophotography object, the Flying Bat and Squid Nebula. This is right next door and a lot harder to see, definitely not an emitting object. Dark nebulae are a nice challenge for me to shoot. Uh, they are, as the name implies, very dark. They're not emitting light like uh, most of the objects that I'll tend to image from Chicago. Even something broadband like the Orion Nebula or the Andromeda Galaxy or some of the narrowband uh, images with hydrogen alpha and oxygen 3 and sulfur 2 light that's coming from those objects emitting that light. In the case of a dark nebula, it's dark. In fact, with optical telescopes, the only way you can tell there's a dark nebula there usually is just the lack of stars or the lack of something else behind it. These are silhouetted. Probably the best known of the dark nebulae is Barnard 33. That's going to be the Horsehead Nebula in the constellation of Orion, which I've imaged before. But there are also plenty of these scattered across the sky, especially in the Milky Way. In fact, technically, some of the darker parts of the Milky Way are dark nebulae that you can see with the naked eye, some of the dark rifts across some of the, uh, the brighter sections of stars that are in the Milky Way. With astrophotography, beyond what just an optical telescope or your naked eye can see, you begin to see not just a lack of stars, but the actual cloud of dust that's there in the way, blocking the light of either the emission nebula behind it or the stars that are there as well. And I really like, especially towards the edge, at the very center of these dark nebulae, often you can't see anything at all, only able to see at the very edges of these dark nebulae, a little bit of that red light creeping through, which is kind of a cool thing to capture. Okay, so for tonight, why am I only using a green filter? What's going on there? Well, I actually already have the red and the blue light for this object. Generally, when I'm going to shoot uh, some broadband images, I'm doing it in the course of one night. I'll do the filter changes and take all the flats and everything. Usually, I get about an hour per channel, maybe a little bit more, depending on how the night goes. Well, in this case, last week, I was able to travel to a well-known location for me. It's a place where you've got an extended family cottage in Michigan. It's a beautiful lakeside location, plenty of awesome sunsets to see, fairly dark skies, about Bortle 3, edging on Bortle 4, kind of like here at Middle Fork, and I got a little bit greedy with what I wanted to image. I saw the week ahead, it looked like we were going to have some clear skies every night. And so I went ahead, and the first night I shot red, through a red filter on my monochrome camera, and got some excellent data, about five and a half hours worth. The next night got cut a little bit short, that was the blue data, but I was still able to get a pretty strong signal. And then I didn't get a clear sky the rest of the time. And this was 
a little bit of a disaster. I felt uh, a little bit embarrassed by that. I should have hedged my bets a little bit more and just said, okay, I'm gonna make sure I get this data and then anything extra that I get is gonna be bonus. Well, I didn't, and so I was stuck without green. Now, for those of you with Bortle 4 at the end of your driveway, maybe that's not a big deal. But for me, I don't get to a dark sky all that often. It's uh, generally maybe four or five times a year. And of course, these things aren't in the sky all year round. Uh, in the case of the Seahorse Nebula tonight, it might be up for a few more months, but what are the chances I'll be able to get to a dark sky on a moonless night, because you can't be shooting these during the full moon or even anything approaching it, and when my family obligations and work are gonna work around that, uh, the chances of those things aligning are pretty slim. So coming out of last week, I was refreshed from the vacation, but I was wondering, okay, am I ever gonna finish this image? Well, lo and behold, here we are a week later, and the skies have cleared, it's a new moon. I'm able to get away, at least for one night, and shoot the Seahorse Nebula. So I'm really excited to uh, get this chance, and hopefully, as long as I'm not jinxing it here, get this image done. Now, this experience has made me move forward in my thinking a little bit about something I've been thinking about for a while. That's acquiring a one-shot color cooled astrophotography camera. So I shoot with monochrome generally, and I'm not looking to give that up. Uh, in fact, from Chicago with narrowband imaging and with the speed of the Rasa, I think monochrome is the way to go for sure. But for these one-off nights where I might not get any other chance this particular astrophotography season to image some of these objects, I'm thinking I might want to get a one-shot color. I can take those flats at the beginning of the night, let it run the whole night, perhaps image multiple objects in that night, and uh, just kind of get it all done and uh, not run into an issue where I'm missing an entire broadband channel at the end of a, a series of astrophotography sessions. So what I'm hoping for is for those of you who use a one-shot color camera that might have some recommendations for me. Uh, I'm not looking to spend more than anything else in my entire astrophotography rig at this point, so something like the 2600 is probably out of my range at this point. But if you've got uh, experience maybe with the 294 MC or uh, maybe the 533, um, but I'm hoping to stay in the ZWO family, that way I can continue to use the AIS IR. But let me know in the comments uh, any uh, recommendations you might have for me to do that. And while you're down there, definitely do give this video a like and also make sure you subscribe to Windy City Astrophotography. All right, so I'm gonna get back to it now. I'm gonna go check on the exposures from the Rasa, and uh, also we got a Meridian flip coming up, so I'm gonna make sure that goes okay. And then after that, maybe get a little bit of sleep uh, before the uh, long drive home in the morning. Uh, but otherwise, hopefully at the end of this video, you're gonna see a very nice uh, final image of the Seahorse Nebula uh, in all its glory with uh, many hours of integration time. So clear skies, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.